Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next episode of Data Science Foundations. Uh, today, we're learning something really quite cool. Um, so previously, we had learned we had learned we can learn. Okay, so we as human beings can think really hard about a problem, make a function, right? That takes uh, the data, the inputs that we have, and gives us an output. And this can be a loan application is a great example. But another great example could be a self-driving car. It takes you know, your current state and it spits out you know, your next driving commands. Um, and we can, as humans, think about a really complicated function, write it down, test it on data that we have seen, and then using bootstrapping, using the percentile confidence interval that we talked about before, we can get an estimate of how well this this function, this guess, this hypothesis will do in the real world. Um, and that was really cool. This is this is the theme of the first half of the class. The first half of the class was basically showing you guys, um, basically showing you guys that we could see data, right? And we need to be very careful about saying things about data that we've not seen. But if we are very careful about that, we can actually take data that we've seen and infer things about data that we have not seen. The, the, the idea behind bootstrapping was we could take a function, and this function could be a hypothesis in this case, and applying it to the data and seeing whether it's correct. So we could take that function, right? And we can apply it to data in the sample, and then we can infer things about data that's outside of the sample. So we can, we can make up a function, we can make up a hypothesis, right? We can test it on historical data. So we make up a loan application decision framework, Okay, as human beings, we think of it, we write it down, we test it on historical data, and based on that test on historical data, we can tell how well we are going to be doing in, in the real world on future data. It's incredibly powerful, it's incredibly cool. What's the problem with this? Well, the problem is we had to think of that function. So what if the function is incredibly complex? Or what if, what if it's so intuitive that it's hard to write down? Or what if you need to think of thousands of these functions because you've got thousands of decisions that you need to make? What do you do? Generally speaking, uh, what data scientists do is they say, hey, I'm lazy. Why don't I just go ahead and offload it to a computer? So in this case, the data scientist takes learning and it lets the computer do it. Okay, how? So what we're going to be learning today is how computers learn and what's the problem with computers learning by themselves? Oof, dangerous. Okay, so assumptions and review. Um, just, just to be very clear, uh, the the way the way our framework works is that there's a population, there's a population of x variables, and we draw in, uh, identically distributed samples from this this population. We get some samples, and these are the x's in our inputs. Uh, we then apply uh, an unknown target function. So if we knew this, you know, we wouldn't be doing it, but we we apply it. It's somewhere in the real world. So this could be the unknown target function of seeing whether the person defaulted on their loan or not. Or in computer vision, it could be the unknown target function that happens in our brain when we look at something and determine whether it's a dog or a cat. So we go ahead and we apply this. So this IID samples from a random variable gives us the x value, the predictors uh, of our uh, inputs. And then this unknown target function will give us the y values, the outcomes. Um, okay. And then we as human beings, we come up with a hypothesis. Right, a final hypothesis as to what the real target function is. We hypothesize how we are looking at things and determining whether they're cats and dogs. Um, and then we, we can go ahead and we can test it on our inputs. Okay, pretty cool. Um, if we test it on our inputs, we can, we can then infer how it will do on all inputs because we're drawing it from, from a random variable x. That's what we've learned so far. So far, it's a big recap on everything we've learned about learning. Okay. Now, how do computers learn? Well, I ask you one fundamental question. What are computers good at? There's only one thing they're good at. Maybe there's more, but there's only one thing we care about. Computers are good at doing simple, repetitive tasks. Does learning and thinking really hard uh, about a particular you know, problem domain sound like a simple, repetitive task? No. It sounds like a very complex, single-shot task. So how do computers learn? Well... They offload the thinking to the humans, and then they do the simple repetitive task afterwards. So it's a two-step process. One, you get a human being. The human being makes a set of hypotheses. So in this case, it, it goes to the computer and it's like, I want to try these 10,000 loan application formulas. Okay? And the computer tests each one of those formulas, each one of those functions, 
on the data, on our hypoth on, on sort of our input data, and tells you which one is the best one. And then you as the human being get to go home, you know, eat your food, blah, 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 come back, and the computer's done testing all the functions and be like, great. Thank you, computer, for doing all of this hard work for me. Um, and the computer will be, you know, obviously thankful for your hypothesis functions that you gave it. It's a, it's a mutual relationship. Um, anyways, so the computer does what it does best and the humans do what they do best. So that's it. And uh, this really puts, at least in my mind, into perspective um, really what computers do and what they're good at. This, this sort of, it's sort of foundational idea of machine learning, at least this sort of overarching foundational idea of machine learning, it's kind of dumb, right? The, and, and please don't take that out of context, uh, but the idea is the computer does just very dumb things. It just tests hypotheses. It tests a thousand hypotheses. That's all it does. Just repeats a very simple action by taking your function that you thought of and applying it to your data and seeing how correct it is. Um, so it tests it, finds its accuracy, and spits back the best one. Very simple. There are complexities here, and we will talk about complexities, but not this time. And these complexities happen inside this, the learning algorithm. So this learning algorithm is the smart part of what the computers do. But for now, you can just think of it as, you know, test each hypothesis. So just a very dumb, just search. So, okay. We know how computers learn. So right, we're done, right? This is the, not quite. There's one problem with the way computers learn. There's a massive problem with the way computers learn. And I think the best way to explain this is by using uh, an interlude, by using an example that, that comes about in real life. Um, okay, so let me ask you a question. You like flipping coins, right? So let's say you're flipping a coin. You flip it 10 times. What's the probability that every time it came up heads? Pretty low, right? Flipping it 10 times, everyone coming up heads. If you're, if you're good at probability or you know this sort of stuff, you'd be like, ah, oh, two to the negative 10. Um, so, so around 0.1%, very unlikely. I'm gonna change the statement slightly. Let's say in a room, there were a thousand people and each one of these people had a coin and they flipped the coin 10 times. What are the chances, and, and pay close attention to how I ask this, what are the chances that any one of those people will have gotten a coin that landed heads all 10 times. Pretty high, ultimately. It's pretty high. Uh, it still has to be low? No, it's actually around 63%. It's pretty likely to be getting at least one with all 10 heads. Why is this? This, this is the second, second, so the first foundational thing that we talked about was the plug-in principle. Um, that was the first half of the class. If, if you only need to remember one thing from the first half of the class, it is the plug-in principle. From the second half of the class, it is this. It, perhaps the, the word to sort of describe what I'm telling to you now is something called the union bound, uh, though I'm, I'm not sure if that's exactly what I'm, the, the extent to what I'm saying. I think there's probably something more foundational. And if anyone knows that, please go ahead and comment to sort of this, this idea that I'm describing here. Uh, but the idea is, is this. Rare events happen rarely, but if there are lots of opportunities for a rare event to happen, it will happen quite likely, right? The idea is that if there's a billion instances where a rare event can happen, it's very likely that it will happen in at least one of those instances. Um, okay, that's the idea. Uh, there's, some, there's some sort of weird trade-off that happens here, and this is as the event gets more rare, as it gets even rarer, so in this case, if, if, if we go ahead and have, instead of 10 heads, you know, a thousand heads, right? It's an incredibly rare event, incredibly, incredibly rare. It's exponentially decreasing uh, in rarity. So we go ahead and we have a thousand heads, uh, then the event will happen less frequently. But if we get more and more people to go ahead and do it, right? The rare event has many, 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 many more opportunities of happening then the rare event will happen more frequently. And so we, so we have this, this, this kind of, these two forces pulling in opposite directions. So we've got one force that's the force, which is number of coins pulling us in the more rare direction. And then we have the, I guess these should be opposite instead of, well, anyways. And, and then the, uh, the number of people, you know, trying these coins pulling us in the, in the opposite direction. Okay. Well, that's cool. You're like, well, thanks, Nate. That great story. <laughs> Let's get on. Um, well, you know, in fact, we've been talking about learning this entire time. Let's change the story. Instead of 
<clears throat> so instead of using coins, let's talk about being correct on a data point. Okay, so being correct on a data point. So a hypothesis being correct on a data point. Now, in real life, there is a probability that a hypothesis will be correct on a data point. How do you know that? Well, you get all the data points, all the infinitely many data points there are, right? And weighted by their likelihood of, of, of you seeing them, right? And then you go ahead and you figure out what the probability of the hypothesis being correct on it on any given data point is. So there's a true prob probability. Okay, let's let's assume for now that the probability of being correct on a data point on a given data point with a random hypothesis is 50%. Okay, very similar to a coin example. Okay, so now I ask you a similar question. So let's take a random hypothesis. So for any given data point, it's going to be correct. Uh, it's going to be have a 50% chance of being correct. What's the probability that will match all 10 of data all 10 of my data points from a random sample? So IID um, samples from X. Uh, I don't know, it's, how am I supposed to know? You should know, it's actually right here. It's 0.1%, it's the exact same question that we asked before. Now, what if instead of testing a single random hypothesis, I picked a thousand random hypotheses? What's the probability now? 63%. I hope you start to see the connection. Once again, we're in this weird trade-off realm. And the trade-off happens to be, the more data points I test my hypothesis on, the less likely that I will get a, an example of, 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 a, of a hypothesis that's, that's crazily different from how it performs in reality, right? So in this case, the random hypotheses in reality get a 50% chance of being correct. But, if I test it lots and lots of times, I test a thousand different hypotheses or the same hypothesis on a thousand different samples, it's likely that one of those times it's going to actually come up by saying, hey, it's 100% correct. So I just want to repeat that one final time and this will be it. Um, we have these two forces pulling against each other. The more data points we have, the more likely it is that our hypothesis will be reporting something closer to what it actually is, you know, the truth of itself. The more hypotheses that I am picking, the more likely, the, the, the greater the chance that one of my hypotheses will be misrepresenting itself. So the rare, rare event is the hypothesis misrepresenting itself, saying it's more accurate than it really should be. And the number of occurrences in this case is the number of hypotheses we get to try. Okay. Funny. It's something strange about this. Let's go ahead and see this in reality and let me talk a little bit about the dangers of this. So we're back to our bin example, right? Back to our bin example. We're happy, we got our bin, we know our secret probability is actually 25%. We're drawing from our bin. So I go ahead and I get some samples from my bin. So I get some samples, I get a nice red, I get a green, I get a red, I get a green, great. Okay, and I can use the sample in order, I can do bootstrap on the sample in order to figure out, you know, What's the true probability that I'll draw a red ball or a green ball from the bin? Cool. Okay, let's do something else. Let's instead try a thousand samples. So I draw a thousand samples from my bin. A thousand samples of five. So a thousand of length five. Okay, so number of data points is five. Number of uh, times for a rare event to occur, a thousand. What's the chance that any one of these samples will be all green? Well, if you see, it's probably pretty high. I got a couple in, in this single, in this iteration, this experiment that I did here. And so in this case, I get back this sample that's all green. So what if instead of doing bootstrap on just a random sample that you had taken, you go ahead and you take a ton of random samples, right? So in this case, a ton of hypotheses. You test each one and you return the best one. Well, it's very likely that you'll find one hypothesis that is correct all the time. And if you do bootstrap on, th on something that's correct all the time, it will just say, yep, 100% accuracy. Problem. The problem is, if we go ahead and we, uh, we test multiple hypotheses on our data, right? And our data isn't, isn't big enough, right? 
So we test lots and lots of hypotheses on the data. It's very likely that the final hypothesis we will be reporting to the user, to us, to the data scientist, is one that is misrepresenting itself. It's overly optimistic on how it will do. And when we go ahead and we do bootstrapping on it, and we go ahead and we try to infer how it will do in the real world, it's going to be dramatically different from how it will do in not the real world. This is a, this is a massive problem. Um, so in this case, uh, even if we have a hypothesis that's only right 25% of the time, if we're just testing it on five data points, there's a very high chance we will find a sample where it is right 100% of the time. And this is the exact same thing. Uh, it's very true as well if we go ahead and we test a thousand hypotheses on the same set of samples. So, so our problem is if we try enough hypotheses, it's very likely that one of them will be really good on our particular sample but not good at all on the test set. Terrible on the test set. Terrible in the real world. Um, sorry for using test set. You guys haven't heard that yet. So terrible in the real world. Um, so what do we do about that? So we're back, we're back to this, this similar problem. We're sort of up a creek. Uh, we know how computers learn, um, but if we allow computers to learn, it's very likely that the hypothesis that they return back to us will look really good, right? But won't actually be that good. So what do we do? So hopefully this will satisfy your curio or will, will pique your curiosity. You'll be interested in sort of seeing the next thing. Uh, next time we will solve this problem and we will talk about a little bit more complexities um, by talking about error measures in the text set. So then we'll go ahead and expound a little bit more on the picture itself. I, I hope you enjoyed today. This is, this is a little bit of a confusing lecture. So please, if you have any questions, go ahead and send them, send them down to the bottom in comments. If I get enough, I, I might just even redo it. I'm not sure. I've taught this lecture a, a couple of times in class and it's always one of the ones that are that's most confusing. So please do let me know. Uh, as always, I've gone ahead and included some comprehension questions. Uh, if you are interested, please go ahead and fill out the comprehension questions. Uh, just sort of write them down in your own notebook. Then look back and see if anyone has answered them for comments. If they have, go ahead, check to see what I said. If not, go ahead, answer. Um, and if you answer them for, uh, in the comment section, I'll go ahead and review them and let, and let you know what I think. Um, I think this first comprehension question here is absolutely wonderful. Uh, this, this is the type of comprehension question that, that sort of leads us to the conclusions uh, that we'll have later on. So if you have any time, I would really recommend doing this one. It, it basically relies on the plug-in principle. Um, okay, thanks, and I'll see you next time.